Hey, everyone, and welcome to today's podcast of The Freelancer Show. Today's guest is Daniel Rosehill, and I am Joel Schaubert, your host for today. And we're going to be talking to Daniel about some topics near and dear to our freelancers' hearts and how to uh, take care of some of the skills besides the uh, thing you're good at, which is your information based skills that you're selling. Dan, what have you uh, what have you been up to lately? Hey Joel, how, how are you doing? Thank you, firstly, for having me on the show. It's uh, great to be here. Um, I have I have been surviving. I feel like that's the best that one can do during the coronavirus pandemic. No. Are you building applications with Vue.js? Then you need to check out the Views on Vue podcast. Every week, we bring in a guest panelist from the Vue community and talk about the interesting things being built with Vue or the changes coming in its ecosystem. You can find it all at viewsonview.com. Yes, it's been a quite, quite a change for all of us. It, it's, it's been crazy. So I'm, I'm based in Israel and we have uh, been fluctuating between, it's actually the lockdown started pretty early here and now we're sort of in 50% lockdown, but I, I'm trying to avoid mentioning the virus or checking the news about it. Uh, that's, that, that's my wellness tactic. That, that's, that's a top wellness advice I have to offer your listeners. <laughs> I, I, have, I, know, have, I have my head in the ground, in other words. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It does. Everybody's had to have some mechanism. I know for myself, when it first started, I went through one day and I didn't really have a plan. And since I did, so two of my clients needed to shut down their work like almost immediately. And since I didn't have a lot to do, I realized, oh, this is not going to work. And so after one day, I realized I was going to have to set some goals and make some plans. So I actually set goals to start two new hobbies when the, the day after the coronavirus lockdown hit. And oh, like, uh, I know awesome. I need something. So yeah, yeah. Everybody's kind of had to come up with their own way. So, you know, we could start out and talk just a little bit about, we've talked to a lot of our guests about this recently, uh, about what kind of changes you've had to make in your business uh, kind of post-corona and and how that's affected your business and what you've done. And we've actually found lots of guests with different approaches and and they've all been informative and kind of, I think it helps people to hear what other people are doing. Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, w- without trying to be flattering or, you know, pandering to the audience here, I think what this has made me realize the whole uh, coronavirus pandemic is how resilient technology is. Um, and I would say basically, so what I do in terms of my work as a freelance writer is I don't have the exact percentage, but let's say 80% on the technology side. And it's just made me kind of think that that's really the, the, the future. It's been, I've seen basically in terms of my own clients, uh, the technology clients, anything in any way related to remote work, uh, I'd say right now is a, is a good area to be in. So I would include in that something as simple as a VOIP system. It could be, you know, a SaaS application uh, taking on Slack, for example. Anything that's connecting people together remotely, I've seen, uh, you know, just... And I, I also think we've seen just the benefit of cloud computing, you know, speaking in very, very general terms here, that, uh, you know, my friends that work in, let's say, more old-fashioned offices, and they basically haven't been set up at all for what's happened they've been kind of caught with their pants down and they're having difficulty so it's made me kind of really appreciate uh some of the work that i do and yeah i just think that that's really i mean in terms of what i'm doing i'm studying for uh aws's cloud practitioner certification and that really has no direct impact on my uh, day-to-day life as a freelance writer Uh, i just want to understand more about the mechanics of cloud computing uh because i think that that's basically just where you know this no nobody saw this coming, but I'm sure there's going to be other crazy business continuity situations where uh, it just seems like a smart place to be right now. That's that that that's my thinking about this basically. Why well, we've seen a lot of that here. It's it's uh, you know, and some people called it not so much of a game changer as an accelerator. So some trends that were happening started to happen much faster. Like I know the stores here that sell any device related to working from home, like extra monitors or mice and modems and things like that, which just practically sold out over a two or three yep. week period. When, when Interna- that, when international that. dynamics. So I decided back in uh, March when this hit that it was finally time to upgrade to a 720p uh, webcam. So I started looking for a very basic Logitech webcam, you know, the most common, I can't remember the exact product name, but uh, I gave up after three months of trying to find this <laughs> webcam. I was talking to like the weirdest suppliers in the country, like places that have, that have, that had never had a uh, inquiry from a member of the public before that just sold to businesses. And they were like, 
we don't have this webcam and we have no idea when we will. It, it was crazy. So I ended up getting it from uh, this eBay webcam, ironically. Uh, and that came in a couple of weeks. But yeah, and, and the thing is the same situation here. It's like getting a webcam is like, is like gold dust at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's some, there's some real big trends that people suspected were coming along. Like I know over here in the States, there's been a lot of talk about how the cost of university education has gone so high that it's considered maybe not really supportable in that same model. And a couple of the bigger universities here, the real big universities have been experimenting with online courses. And that's really the, 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 the virus made that trend accelerate dramatically. So I think it's something that wasn't like invented because of Corona, but massively accelerated by it. Yeah, so I, I think actually, examples of that. I think acceleration is just the perfect word to describe what's happened. It's kind of funny because, I mean, I've been using Zoom for, you know, I'm going to say three years. I use Linux, as I've talked about in several of my online blogs. And actually, I started using Zoom just because their Linux client is, comparatively speaking, not complete garbage. Uh, so that's what got into it. It's, it's just kind of funny because it started out as this relatively obscure, you know, people use Skype and they're like, what's Zoom? Uh, and now everybody's like asking me, do you have a Zoom account? I'm like, what do you mean to buy a Zoom account? I've been using Zoom for three years. Um, so yeah, it's it's just kind of changed the game. And it, I mean, I'm, I am I would say this, in, in my opinion, I, I, it's, I kind of have a hard time feeling sympathetic for anybody that, uh, like my friends' companies that have not been ready for this. Because as you say, it's been, you know, we've had, uh, you know, if you do just uh, Slack and we've had VOIP and we've had uh, video conferencing, we've had you know, easily affordable cloud storage is basically, I, I feel like there's very little excuses really for a company to say, oh, we only have a local server and uh, we haven't really thought about how people can connect to the server. We don't have a VPN. You know, I feel like those kind of companies, the really legacy uh, tech companies, it's hard not to feel like a judgmental person at the moment to them. But I do think this acceleration will completely, as you say, accelerate things that you know, if there's another situation like this, that we, we won't we won't have this kind of like discussion about working from home and how do you do it? Because that's very much the discussion that's happening now, I think. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be really interesting to see, like, uh, you know, let's say let's say there is a vaccine that comes out this this winter, which seems now to be fairly likely. I know we've got uh, our director, uh, our country's director of, of medicine, Fauci, said that there are now currently as of recording of this, which is mid-July, that there are already two drugs in stage three trials, two different companies. And so he said, it seems likely one of those will make it all the way through the end, possibly by December. So it'll be interesting to see like, if there is basically a way for everybody to be inoculated, does it really go back to anything like it was, especially in terms of working from the office when people find out, oh, I can get so much more done from home. Is there really necessary for all of us to drive in and be in the little box? Right. I think I think that's just such a big unresolved question. I mean, I, I guess I've seen the people that have started working from home have, uh, I, I have seen a lot of people that have not really enjoyed it. And they're saying, you know, this isn't really great. And as soon as I can get back to the office. So I've been kind of working from home for about two years. I work from home. I try to mix it up a bit. And to be honest, mixing it up less has been really tough. By mixing it up, I just mean stuff like working from coffee shops and then maybe working from a client site. And I think it was back in February where I canceled the meeting with the client because I was like, there's really no reason for, you know, at this point in time for me to do this because we could just talk on the phone or talk on Zoom. And is there really any point? And uh, that was, that was I, I have asthma. So I was freaking out for the first two weeks about that, that I was going to be, I was a super high risk uh, coronavirus person. Uh, so I calmed down a little bit as, you know, the data came in and said, it's not necessarily such a big deal. And I think I'm pretty much in the same position as anybody else. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was kind of, it's, it's a, a lot of people are saying they don't like it, but I would say it's actually taken me two years to sort of master in inverted commas, the process of working from home, by which I mean, I don't think it's surprising that people just start forcibly and then they're like, oh, I actually hate this. This is depressing because I think it takes a long time to figure out, you know, you need to schedule time to meet people. There's a lot of things that it, it just takes time to get into that flow. So I don't think it's surprising that people are having a tough time. And I do think it's kind of, there's a lot of jobs where you say, do it, 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 it shines a really hard light on a lot of jobs and the, do we need to be together for a lot of things, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Can, can we find another way to do this that's more effective, takes less, less downtime, driving back and forth? I think all those things are in question. Moving stuff 
into the cloud more and more. So tell me about uh, how your studies are going on the AWS cloud partition. Or how did you decide? How did you pick that? And, and how's that going? Uh, the selection process. So I, I was basically, as I said, it, I thought it was a smart idea to do a technical certification. I actually started with the LPIC certification, which is for those who don't know, Linux Professionals Institute. So uh, I was cocky. I thought I'd been using Linux for so long on the desktop that it would be uh, really easy. And then after about three lessons of, you know, grappling with CLIs and graph and all this, I kind of said, I mean, so what it would say is my interest in technology has always been more conceptual. So I've worked at companies where people are like, you know, what are you doing wasting your time in marketing? You know, become a developer. And it's funny because, you know, I've, I've done, I've taken a couple of Python courses and I've tried that and I just think it's a very different, uh, different brain that I, I don't have that brain. I don't have the hardcore brain for development, the really, you know, logical, mathematical left-sided brain. I'm more of a creative. So I was surprisingly bored by the Linux coursework and so I clicked on to AWS because I just because I've been using AWS for a few years, just you know S3 buckets and stuff like that. And uh, a few lessons in, I was like, God, this is really really interesting. It just it it's it's more conceptual. It's less you know dealing with the, as I said the command line interfaces, and uh, I just find it much more engaging. So I'm using the site called Linux Academy. This is clearly not a uh, uh, you know push for their for their lessons but uh, i found the aws stuff interesting and uh yeah that's it i I did their practice exam today so i think it got uh 70 which is okay for a first attempt and i need to get that up and then i can actually take that certification but yeah i mean it, it, this it's, this all comes back to just what i'm saying uh for freelancers about this is my way of deepening my engagement with the technology sector because there's this there's one line of thinking and i think that it's really uh problematic that you know i I see this by the way a lot in israel there's this phenomenon of coding boot camps that kind of uh, are very glitzy and they'll say you know we'll make you a a back-end developer in three weeks or you know a front-end developer or (laughs) cybersec or devops or like whatever the the trend at the moment is and i just know having worked in tech startups like I'm always in awe at how much, like the, the developers, the places I work have always been really kind of like take me under their wing and showed me a few Linux commands and they've brought me up, but they just have that theoretical underpinning that I think it's kind of ridiculous to claim anybody can become a DevOps professional in six weeks. So yeah, that's basically why I've, I've just taken this approach. If I think it's a bit more modest to say this is a little certification and I understand cloud computing. And if, you know, in the future I'm working for, a company in the cloud space, uh, you know, I'll just be able to maybe demonstrate that I know perhaps a little bit more than some other people. It'll give me a competitive edge or, or so I hope. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, that's great. I mean, one of the things really interesting about the whole, I, I work with both AWS and Azure, the Microsoft uh, cloud system. And one of the things that's really, really stunning or surprising to people is how giant they are, literally how many products are available in each of them. And a lot of what's out there now is, I'm not sure about the cloud practitioner in in particular, but a lot of what's out there is just to become familiar with simply the breadth of what's available. So if someone is interested in moving to the cloud, you can at least have a conversation with them and say, oh yeah, this thing you're doing here in your server room, that could be mapped to this piece of the cloud services. And this piece over here could be mapped to this other piece. And that and a little bit of pricing, and all of a sudden you're into some very interesting discussions with the company thinking about moving into the cloud. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's fascinating. So I'm not so familiar with Azure or Google Cloud. I've just I've used AWS, as you said, a small bit. But I kind of had this epiphany moment, uh, you could call it, when I was doing this. And I was speaking to a friend who I used to work for. Um, the company's called, it's just a SaaS company. So I was like, you know, I've just been learning about this and learning about how all these pieces of the cloud fit together. I've used EC2 and I've used S3 and I understand that they need the network. And I'm like... So I kind of said to my friend, uh, so you run a SaaS company. So does that mean you basically just build software on this and then you sell it to people? And he's like, that's exactly how it works. So it was just interesting (laughs) to me that um, the mechanics are kind of, you know, you could almost say they're a little bit boring, learning about knuckles and all, you know, the the details of how clouds work. But uh, when I got into it, I realized that this is the, let's call it the plumbing that makes the whole current craze of cloud computing and every, everything is a service that that's basically how it works. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do think it's, 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 it's very, it's very interesting. 
I don't really have thoughts on Azure versus uh, AWS versus Google Cloud. But, um, you know, as, as you say, that just the sheer volume of uh, the internet and uh, everyday services we use that are being hosted on stuff like AWS, it's absolutely mind-blowing. Yeah, it's it's uh, been an ongoing revolution for some time. Yeah, I see that you've got a, uh, a new book coming out. Do you want to uh, give us kind of a, a high-level intro to that and tell us what's uh, what's happening there? Sure. Uh, the book is called The Confused Freelancer's Guide to Technology. And I'm, wait, I'm, 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 wait, I'm waiting for the point when somebody leaves a view on Amazon saying that after reading this book, I, I, I now am a confused freelancer. I'm, wait, I'm waiting for that review. <laughs> uh, have, have, hasn't happened yet. But so basically, yeah, it's, it, it's a book I wrote because working with a lot of uh, writers over the years, I think a lot of writers are have kind of a very basic understanding of some people are just really not technically inclined at all. And just, you know, fielding queries and writers, Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups and various groups about how to do certain things. Uh, I decided that um, no one, you know, there's a lot of entry level books for technology and dummies guides and that kind of thing. And I thought it would be good to write something specifically for tiny businesses. I mean, how much how much more, how much tinier can you get than a one person freelancing shop? So uh, I try to strike a balance between, you know, enough information and also giving some detail. So I talk about stuff like uh, hosting, cybersecurity, uh, just things like that in order to, I guess, uh, prep freelancers for scaling that if they don't want to just, you know, do the typical thing of setting up a website on Wix and it takes them two minutes, two minutes, and they don't really actually understand or learn anything about what's going on. Uh, so I thought I'd write this book that it could give them the basic, you know, to go a few steps beyond that, that they would uh, be able to understand technology for a few years into their growth and maybe make that scaling journey a little bit easier. Hey, folks, this is Charles Maxwood. And over the last few years, I've gotten to know a lot of great people within the Microsoft community and specifically in the .NET area. Uh, one of our guests from JavaScript Jabber, Sean Clabo, actually reached out to me and said he wanted to start a show on .NET. And there are a ton of people out there that I feel like sometimes get neglected in the .NET space. So if you're one of those folks, uh, you've been listening to maybe one or two of the other .NET focused or Microsoft focused podcasts for a while and thought, well, where's the devchat.tv style podcast for me in .NET? You can find it. It's at adventuresin.net.net is spelled out D-O-T-N-E-T. Adventuresin.net.com. Go check it out today. Yeah, that's great. Is this is this the kind of thing where you... Um through on personal experience, like learn from what I did right and from what I did wrong? Yeah, um, there is definitely a lot of personal experience uh, starting from, uh, you know, setting up my first account on a Bluehost uh, shared hosting. About 10 years ago, I used to run a student news website uh, when I was back in university. Um, so yeah, I've just been doing that kind of stuff for a while. And yes, definitely stuff has gone wrong, such as uh, getting hacked by WordPress malware. Uh, so that was an interesting experience of, why you shouldn't do, do things like host eight different websites on a uh, shared hosting provider. So yeah, there's definitely been a lot of calamities, disasters uh, that have uh, shown me what not to do. So hope, 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 hope I'm not leading other people down the road of disaster or, or becoming confused <laughs> freelancers. <laughs> uh, a couple of those stories are just, you know, a lot of times just knowing what's possible and what you're looking out for is half the battle for people. So I think that's the that's the great uh, the great help in something like this. Yeah, that's great. Andrew. So can we go like a little deeper into maybe some of the challenges that be facing a new freelancer, especially one who, like you're saying, maybe a writer, somebody who's not real technical. What are what are some of the nuts and bolts of things they might end up having to deal with that might surprise them? I think there are quite a few different. I think it's easy to underestimate the type of challenge they will have. So I know a lot of people, there's a common line of thinking of do things that don't scale. And I'm very much on the do things that do scale side of things. So, I mean, the, I mean, the basic bare bone technical requirements to get started as a freelance writer, let's say the example you chose are pretty simple. I mean, it's easy. I, I, could, I could throw out things I think you should have. And you could throw back saying, you don't really need that. So, you know, I could say you need a website and uh, you could say, uh, not, not you, but, you know, an average freelancer might say, just set, up a, just set up a Wix on their subdomain and have it branded. So really it's about, I think, professionalism and putting in place good systems. Um, in terms of what I recommend and, you know, speaking to a lot of freelance writers, what I see people need, the essentials would be having a website. If you're not using one of these uh, build-it-yourself 
website builders that I'm really not such a fan of. Of course, you're going to need hosting. Uh, you're going to need a domain name. You're going to use, I mean, G Suite, I think is great, or Office 365 or some kind of managed collaboration suite. A CRM is very, very helpful. And there's, you know, CRMs and there's uh, some people like these cold emailing solutions, which are a small bit different. Marketing automation and email newsletter solutions, such as MailChimp, for example, Google Analytics. I mean, the list really goes on. And the one thing that people always forget and that people don't like to talk about is a backup, uh, some kind of a backup functionality so a common one i see all the time with writers is uh, and this is this this has happened to me is that you know they write stuff for websites or they do a podcast like this and uh you know they forget to uh say you cast or you know they, you know something like that that like they move hosts and they forget to migrate over files and it's gone forever so uh that's really important i'm a big advocate for uh being extremely particular about backup so you know I recommend if someone writes something on a website that they, their mind should immediately go to backups and taking an on-site copy and ideally migrating that up to a cloud source as well just to keep two backup copies. So that's a, that's a common one that people like to not think about. Wow, let's, uh, let's get into this even a little deeper here. So if someone was just starting out, what would you tell them about why a website is important enough that it's worth their time and, and how, they, how they should get started with that? I'm sure. I mean, if someone's building a website as a freelance writer, I mean, I think WordPress, WordPress is the CMS I've used most. I don't think that WordPress is beyond most people in terms of, you know, getting to grips with. I mean, there's other choices for CMS too, but, you know, I think generally a basic shared hosting package Running WordPress, I think Cloudflare is great. Um, I strongly advocate anyone building even a shared hosting site uh, uses Cloudflare just for you know CDN and for security and stuff like that. And email, I mean, I've written, I've described in in the book about how you can use just basic cPanel email, but I don't think that's a good solution for most people. You know, setting up u- using some kind of managed managed email provider makes sense. And that's, those are really the bare bones. I mean, you don't need a CRM, um, but uh, it does certainly make life a lot easier. So I think it's sometimes my personal philosophy is, uh, you know, setting up stuff that you're going to need. If you're looking at freelancing for the long term, I think it makes a lot of sense to set up a CRM, setting up a email, email automation system, marketing automation systems, those kind of things, because uh, it's very difficult to do things like scale substantially if you're just using a, you know, a flash some kind of a flash website that you've, you've built to one of these, uh, what you see is what you get editors. Right. And how would somebody know, like if they're getting started in this and they're like, okay, I'm, I'm doing the freelancer thing. I need to get some of my systems down and all that. You talked a little bit about the fact that it's good to pick something that actually can scale. Let's tell, tell people a little bit about what that even means to scale and how you would tell us something will or won't scale when you're looking at picking your different tools. Sure. I mean, in terms of scaling, I would say it's a good idea to, you know, just to do something that doesn't have a low cap. So, I mean, it's easy to talk about stuff um, in terms of, you know, let's just take web hosting as a very simple example. So obviously, if you're on something like a shared hosting account, that's not really the ideal environment. If you're, let, let's, I mean, let's say I think a lot of freelancers, and I would include myself in this category, aspire towards bigger things. So um, I don't permanently intend to be a single person freelancer. I would like to morph towards being an agency one day, uh, ideally, and uh, beyond that, who really knows? But, uh, you know, if you're thinking like that from the very outset and you want to become, you want to scale up to become, let's say, an agency, perhaps bringing in a couple of other partners, certainly, I, you know, I don't think a Wix website is a good idea. I think if you do something, and I'm, I'm not trying to hate on Wix here. I mean, there's plenty of other Squarespace that, you know, they, they, they have their own competitors, but doing something like shared hosting and, you know, I, a thing I love is a, is, a, is a good staging environment. So if you're going to be pushing updates to your site, a few times a day and maybe you'll bring in a web design resource maybe you will bring in a graphic design resource you know it's a nice thing to do to uh to create a staging environment for let's say a wordpress site or you can stage through git uh you know just these are just the technical nuances as you know but um i think just thinking like that in terms of striving having the infrastructure at your disposal to get bigger and better you know that might mean moving up from shared hosting to vps hosting uh maybe ultimately moving on to as, as we talked about something like aws but just kind of planning for the next step and looking as well when you're signing up to i always look when i'm signing up for a new service let's say mailchimp i like to look at the limits i also like to look at the backup because that's just my kind of pet peeve is there a way to export this data if I want to leave and move on to something bigger and better? And, uh, you know, what's the limit? Is there, 
if I'm using SMTP through my hosting company, what, what is there a limit of messages or that they're limiting per day? So uh, I like to think about all these things and, uh, you know, try to put in place systems that are going to serve me for, let's say, at least a year into the future. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. It is disappointing when you set something up and you find out it just all that time in, you find out it won't even actually do what you need. And then you're, you're really kind of, oh, right. whatever time you put in is kind of lost and you're starting over. Right. I, I mean, I was looking for a CRM. Um, I, I, I've used these open source CRMs for quite some time. Uh, Sugar and Espo and VTiger. And, you know, they're great. You can just run them on your own server and uh, you don't, you know, you can do workflows and automation and everything is basically possible. And when I started looking for SaaS CRM, so I was just looking through the various options and it was, uh, it's difficult. You move between providers and they have certain tiers and the tiers can change. So I think there is, you know, I think the cloud is great, but there is a lot of, there's, there's, there's a lot to pay attention to and it's easy. The problem is that if you're, if you're using something like a CRM and it becomes an integral part of your business development workflow, when you have to leave, it's a real, real pain. So I think it's, you know, uh, this coming back to the scaling thing of, uh, Picking systems that scale from the outset, so you can you can defer that pain as much as possible. So, do you talk much in your in your book when you're advising people about? It seems like one of the big themes we have over and over on the freelancer show is a lot of people can probably figure out how to do the work that they do, how to how to coordinate with people. A lot of people, at least if they've worked somewhere else, they've seen some systems like that. The one thing it seems like people are always unfamiliar with if you're coming from working full time and getting to full freelancing is how to find customers and how to deal with that. What kind of things do you talk about in your book for with regard to just being able to find customers and how your systems will help you? So, I mean, what's probably more more relevant is on the outbound side. So, you know, we talked we talked a few minutes there about CRM and marketing information. So I, I do have a section where I'm discussing inbound marketing and the various uh, you know, typical parts of an of an inbound marketing plan. I also like the open source stuff a lot, just just from my uh, my interest in Linux and open source. But you know, there's a lot of closed source tools on the market too. So in terms of those tools, I talk about in the book. You know, keyword research on external platforms is not something that I talk about, but that would be important. Uh, you know, an, an email system and a CRM. But I don't think beyond that, you actually need. Uh, you need a lot in terms of technology. Yeah, so for outbound, as you said, CRM and uh, email email marketing automation tool. And for inbound marketing, I mean, I, I think technically doing the hard work of keyword research and blogging is, uh, is not really so much a technical challenge as it is just a manpower challenge. I mean, it's an awful lot of work. And this is something I do mention. I, I think a large part of the difficulty of being a freelancer is being the person responsible for as I said, uh, the backups, the IT, the business development, the sales and marketing, and then finally doing what you get paid for. So you have to wear a huge amount of different hats. And I think that actually just gets exhausting. I think it's, po- it's very hard to do it all well. But you, you know, in terms of the technology, I think that the, uh, you can certainly put in place the basic stuff for both inbound and outbound marketing. Uh, and you, you certainly have choices within each product category as well. Yeah, it does become the one man band. I, I, I know. I know there's this Tom Petty song where he actually is sitting at the drum, has a harmonic he can grab onto. He sings and he's got a guitar. So it's, it's that that one. Uh, I, I can't remember if it's "You Don't Know How I Feel." I think it might be that video. It's uh, it always that always reminds me of being a freelancer, just seeing him trying to play all those instruments at one time. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm very, I'm very much trying to figure this out as well. So uh, it's not, it's, it's, it's not easy. And uh, I think recently I just realized this week that it's basically you have to realize that you're fighting a losing battle uh, in terms of trying to do everything. I mean, outsourcing. So I don't, I don't outsource work in terms of the writing work that I do. Uh, I outsource bits and pieces of, you know, ancillary work like business development and you know, getting a VA to look up leads and stuff like that. But uh, if you're if you're struggling with burnout, and I've certainly the last few weeks felt uh, badly in need of a, a holiday, I, I think you just have to realize that it's an impossible battle to try to keep it all going. Just you know, and there's, it, particularly when you get busy, it's just it, there's no way you can really do it all yourself. So you have to just get good at get good at stepping back and, and uh, take, get, getting a bit more hands off sometimes. Yes. Yeah, so uh, when is the new book out? Is it is it out now or is it uh, pending? 
Yep, uh, it is indeed out in a paperback and ebook format on Amazon.com. So you can download that onto your Kindle. And it's actually on uh, when you publish on Amazon, it goes through all the Amazon marketplaces. So it's on Amazon UK and Amazon Germany and et cetera. Wherever, wherever Amazon has a marketplace, it's, uh, it's on there. Great. Is there anything else you would like to uh, cover before we go to picks? No, I think that's about it. I mean, basically what I would say to somebody setting up technology is... Uh, you know, spend just a little bit of time going through the various product categories. Think if, if you are tempted, you know, I know you have a more tech savvy listenership, but I sometimes question my own decisions in terms of, you know, going with doing things a slightly harder way. But I do find that um, it, it's a lot of work at the start. Let If we're, you know, building a, a WordPress a website on WordPress or Drupal or Joomla, uh, versus just using a template in one of these uh, quick quick solutions. But, you know, that's just a specific case of a general thing. It's a little bit of work at the start, but if you're in it for the long term, I think it makes sense to go with these kind of solutions because when you do scale, when you start moving from one client to four clients to 10 clients, and you've got a business development, de- development machine and you've got an inbound marketing machine running. When you get to that point of overwhelm, to have these good systems already in place makes a big difference. One of the biggest pain points that I find as I talk to people about software is deployment. It's really interesting to have the conversations with people where it's, I don't want to deal with Docker. I don't want to deal with Kubernetes. I don't want to deal with setting up servers. I don't, you know, all of these different things. And in a lot of ways, DevOps has gotten a lot easier. And in a lot of ways, DevOps has also kind of embraced a certain amount of culture around applications, the way we build them, the way we deploy them. And I've really felt for a long time that developers need to have the conversations with DevOps or adopt some form of DevOps so that they can take control of what they're doing and really understand when things go to production, what's going on so that they can help debug the issues and fix the issues and find the issues when they go wrong and help streamline things and make things better and slicker and easier so that they'll more generally go right. So we started a podcast called Adventures in DevOps. And I pulled in one of the hosts from one of my favorite DevOps shows, Nell Shamrell Harrington from the Food Fight Show. And we got things rolling there. And so this is more or less a continuation of the Food Fight Show where we're talking about the things that go into DevOps. So if you're struggling with any of these operational type things, then definitely check out Adventures in DevOps. And you can find it at adventuresindevopspodcast.com. Great. All right. Let's move to picks. So this is part of the show where we just talk about something we're interested in. It can be a hobby. It can be something technical. uh, Just uh, something our listeners enjoy just hearing the various picks. So uh, what are your picks for the show? So one thing that I that I uh, that I got recently in my life is a uh, network attached storage. And I thought this would be a good one for uh, a technology centric podcast. So uh, I got the new Synology NAS. Um, the DS920 Plus. Now, if you're doing video, so I'm trying to do some more YouTube work myself at the moment because as a ghostwriter for the last three years, it's appeared that I don't really exist. Uh, so I'm doing everything in my power to avoid that. So um, that is that has basically made a um, big difference in terms of just basically, you know, wh- when you start doing video work and putting out a podcast, you could be easily generating one or two gigs of data per day. So that NAS is brilliant. I don't, I don't have to be economical. I have like, you know, 20 terabytes on my local network, put stuff on the NAS, back that up to the cloud. I talked about my uh, obsession with backups. And uh, yeah, that's just been great. If, you know, doing, doing things the professional way and just instead of storing stuff on my control plane, it doesn't, uh, you know, the hard drive doesn't fail in the middle of the night or something like that. Yeah, definitely. Great. All right, network attached storage. Um, for me, the pick is going to be, this is going to be an interesting pick. It's something that kind of helped me get through the COVID. The, the just kind of needed to do, do uh, something new. And it is lessons. I've found that I'm a person who really clicks with having somebody show me how to do something. And so if I start a new hobby or something like that, I usually look for a good teacher and go get a few lessons. And so I started tennis this year and found this fantastic teacher out, uh, out just outside the kind of the suburbs of the Minneapolis area, out there towards Stillwater. And uh, I've been getting tennis lessons and it has really been fantastic. It's been just so much fun to, you know, progress along that, progress along the hobby much more quickly than it would be if I was just watching videos or trying to guess what to do or just playing with friends. So 
that's my my pick for the week is lessons in general I, I, and tennis I, lessons I'm in instruction, but I, I i i think you said that you had taken up two hobbies during the pandemic or did i did i hear that wrong yeah i did i needed i needed i knew i was going to need something to do during the during the pandemic and so i picked up a couple new hobbies i uh, picked up tennis as a new sport and i bought a bass guitar and decided to learn a new instrument mm. so that so, has so definitely been it's been nice not to just, you know, sit around and think about the things that I can't do and actually have all the all that I needed to do is between the two new hobbies. Right. I think I think cre- creativity is really important to anything that really gets me going. My other hobby has been eating watermelon. So I'm definitely not as <laughs> not 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 as healthy as you putting tennis balls back and forth across the net. But uh, I guess I have time. I, 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 I feel like this kind of period is going to be going on more than either of us really wanted to. So I have I have time to get into the tennis. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, let's talk about the ways people can reach you, like where, um, your book title and, and how people can reach you if they want to reach out to you. How, what are the different ways people can get a hold of you? Sure. So the book title is The Confused Freelancer's Guide to Technology. And as I said, if you do read the book just uh, and you don't like it, that's, that's fine. Just don't leave a comment saying you're a confused freelancer <laughs> because it will ruin It'll, 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 ru- it'll ruin my day. And in terms of getting in touch, people can contact uh, danielrosal.com. Uh, there's two L's in Rosal and that'll just forward to a contact form or something. So that's probably the best way to get in touch for anyone who wants to. Great. Well, thanks, Daniel, for coming on the show. And this was Daniel Rosehill was our guest today. And I'm Joel Schaubert, your host for today. And on behalf of Charles Maxwood, I'd like to invite you all to come over to devchat.tv and check out all of the latest podcasts. There's quite an array. I think we've got two relatively new ones in the last couple months. So always something new going on there. And with that, we will sign off and see you all next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me on, Joe. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.